Good morning, everyone. How are you? Thanks for being here. Um, we'll go ahead and start, and hopefully we have a few more trickle in late. Um, but thank you all for being here. If I haven't had the chance to meet you yet, my name's Trey Store, and I work for Momentum as the Community Outreach Coordinator. So if you've done any outreach projects this week, uh, that uh, that's my job. I set them up, and I communicate with youth pastors and I can communicate with ministry organizations and set up transportation and lunches and signups and all sort of things. Um, but today I get to do the, my favorite part of my job and that's speak about the Bible. Um, so uh, this morning uh, I'd like to begin by sharing a little bit about myself. Um, here's my family right here. Uh, at my brother's wedding, this is me. My younger brother, Dayton's 13. My mom's awesome. My sister, Danae, is seven. My brother, Blake, is 22, and his wife, Lauren. My dad. And then my favorite out of all of them is my little brother, Chase, uh, who is here as a student. Um, so, yeah. And then uh, here's me with my girlfriend, Sylvia. She's awesome. Uh, I love her a lot. Um, um, so... Today I have the privilege of talking to you about God's Word, but the most important thing I really want you to know about myself is my age. Uh, I'm 19 years old, and I know there are some students here, at least one that I know, who is also 19. Um, I'm a kid, and I understand where you're coming from. I get what it's like to be a high school student. Just two years ago, I was a student at Momentum on the Road. And I, I understand that it's hard to live for Jesus in your schools. I understand that as a young person, sometimes you struggle to understand the Word of God. However, as a student at Marysville High School, God's Word changed me. And I want to share that with you this morning. And I want to give you tools so that as a young person, you have the tools to read God's Word and you can allow it to change your life. Um, this morning, I've got some slides. I think I made like 22 slides or something like that. So the, the, the information on the slides is very important. Please write down what's on the slides. If you walk away with nothing else, the stuff on the slides is your tools. It is what equips you. Uh, so please write down what's on the slides. Write down questions too, because if we have time, I'll, I'll take some questions at the end. But before we go any further, let's begin how all power tracks should begin with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for this morning. Uh, thank you for your goodness, your glory, your beauty. God, I'm just so blessed to be here this morning with these students. Um, as we step into your word this morning, as we, as we talk about your holy word, God, I just ask that these students would have confidence in their ability to know your word. Uh, although we're young, although I myself am young, Lord, you have, you have given us the power to understand your word through your Holy Spirit. And I just ask that uh, your word would take over these students and change their thoughts, their affections, their actions, their words, and, and take over their whole lives. Um, God, as I speak, I just ask that there would be no distraction in this room, but that the focus would be fully on you. I ask that uh, there, the, the discomfort of sitting on the floor or the discomfort of a crowded room or, or the tiredness would not distract these students from hearing your truth. I ask that the devil would no, have no foothold on this place, but that you would fill it and that your truth would be proclaimed above everything else, Lord. I pray these things in your son's beautiful, glorious name. Amen. When I think about our lives on earth, I think about one of our family friends. There's a woman in our church, and she used to have lung cancer. She had tumors inside of her body, and it was a serious problem. And if she just let that cancer live, it was going to take the life out of her. She, she couldn't live and thrive because she was stuck with cancer. What she needed was a doctor to go in with a scalpel and cut that cancer out of her so that she could be freed from the sickness that overtook her life. And that's exactly what happened. She had a doctor go in with a scalpel, cut the cancer out, and she's now freed from her cancer and she can live and thrive and be healthy. And she doesn't have that tumor in her body anymore. And when I think about that example, when I think about that woman in our church, it, it makes me think of exactly what the Bible is. The Bible is the scalpel that cuts us. And sometimes it hurts to read some of the truths that the Bible says, but the Bible cuts out the sin and the brokenness in our lives and it mends us 
so that we have the power, we have the ability to live and thrive and live a healthy life for the sake of Jesus Christ. That's why I've titled this session Living and Active because of Hebrews 4.12, which says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. This Bible, the word of God, is powerful because first and foremost, it's his word. It's spoken by our all-powerful, all-glorious God. And that means that it's living and active. It's timeless. It, it's not old. In fact, it, it lasts for generations. It will last for eternity. And it matters to our lives. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces the division of soul and spirit. It's like that sword that cuts us. But it's not, it's not a sword that kills. It's a scalpel that heals. It's a scalpel that allows us to live the life that we're intended to live. It pierces us on the inside. It reveals who we are and it allows us to be changed for the glory of God. The thing about my life, though, is that I didn't always believe that the Bible was powerful. I didn't always believe that it was the scalpel that healed us. So let me tell you what I thought about the Bible just three and a half years ago. I thought the Bible was useless. I, I had never picked up my Bible until three and a half years ago. I thought it was just an old book that was a waste of time. I thought it wasn't relevant. I thought it might not even be true. And I was sure it was good for pastors, but I'm not a pastor, so I thought I didn't need it. And while you might not actually say those words, I think that many of us actually think those things, that maybe the Bible is not relevant. Maybe it's not true, or maybe it doesn't have power. And maybe even if you don't explicitly think it, you might live that way practically. You might, you might not actually read the Bible because you don't see its, its goodness and its power for your life. But in reality, as I said, the Bible is essential to our lives. It's the most important part of our lives. And without it, we don't have the ability to know God or have a relationship with him. It has incredible value for our lives. So this morning, they asked me to share my story of how God changed my life those last three and a half years through the Bible. So I want to talk about four things that the Bible does for us, and then I want to give practical advice of how you, as a student, as a 15, 16, 17-year-old student, can read the Bible today. And I want to challenge all of you. Write this challenge down. Don't forget it. Pay attention for today. Write down what's on the slides. And for the next 30 to 60 days, apply what I'm talking about. For the next 30 to 60 days, do the, the six points at the end of how to read the Bible and pray that God would let that word change you. So pay attention for today, write down what's on the slides, and for the next 30 to 60 days, apply what I talk about and see how the word of God changes you. So just as I said, I'm gonna talk about four things that the word of God does for us. As any good preacher, I did, uh, did alliteration here. No, just kidding, that was a, it was an accident, but they all just all happened to be S's. Um, so the word of God, scripture, the Bible, it saves, sanctifies, sends, and sustains. It saves, sanctifies, sends, and sustains. We'll break these down little by little, but write these down. It's important to know. Saves, sanctifies, sends, sustains. The Bible does all of those things for us, and we can't do any of them on our own. We can't do any of them on our own, and I know because I tried. Like I said, if you asked me three and a half years ago, I would have told you that the word of God was useless. I would have told you I didn't need God's word. I didn't want God's word, and I could be a perfect person without reading my Bible. And that left me broken. For the first 16 years of my life, I believed I was good enough on my own. I grew up in, in the church. I went to church for two services every Sunday, church on Sunday night, church on Wednesday nights. My dad was an interim youth pastor at our church, and my family was well-known in the church, and I thought that was good enough to save me. My parents had taught me from a young age all about Bible trivia, so I could quote scripture to you all day long. I actually, I even fooled my youth pastor. He let me preach a sermon at youth group twice, actually, two times in high school. I thought I was good because I could win the Bible trivia games 
because my parents loved the Lord and I thought that was good enough to save me. Plus, I knew that God saw how awesome I was. God saw me winning the Bible trivia games. And so since my parents' faith had rubbed off on me and I won the Bible trivia, I was destined to go to heaven. I was a model Christian in the youth group. A model Christian in the youth group. Because no one knew as much about the Bible as I did. And I followed all the rules, knew the answers, had the perfect family. And that was all I needed in my life. I didn't need the Bible. I just needed to win the Bible trivia games. And as I got older, my mindset didn't change. I thought I was good enough. I didn't pursue a relationship with God because there was no need for me to pursue a relationship with God. I thought I was good enough. And this ended up being a huge problem because in reality, I was worshiping myself instead of looking to the one who deserved all the glory. I was looking to myself. I was trying to make other people notice me instead of pointing others to Christ. And that problem of worshiping myself became so much greater when I got to high school and realized I was pretty good at baseball. My freshman year of high school, I made the varsity baseball team and pitched eight scoreless innings. My sophomore year, I finished with a .7 ERA, which if you don't know is very good. It was the fourth best in the state of Ohio. I was good enough to win pitcher of the year my sophomore year in Ohio's most competitive conference. As a 16-year-old, I was throwing 88 miles an hour and I was expected to throw at least 95 or 96 by the time I graduated high school. I had a bunch of D1 offers, including full rides from three of the NCAA's top 25 teams at one point. And also at one point, my, my high school pitching coach got in contact with the pitching coach at Vanderbilt University, which at the time was the number one baseball team in the country. But college wasn't my goal. I didn't want to play baseball in college. My goal was to get drafted out of high school play in the minor leagues, and eventually make my way up to play Major League Baseball. And baseball was my life. I was doing whatever I could to reach that goal to play baseball out of high school. I wanted, I wanted to go play pro. I wanted people to look at me and see how good I was and be impressed with me. And I wanted colleges to notice me. I wanted MLB scouts to notice me. I wanted other high schools to respect me. I wanted other high schools to fear me. But it was all about me. I was working out at least 10 times a week watching baseball all the time, thinking about baseball every second. I ate, drank, and breathed baseball, but really I was eating, drinking, and breathing myself because I wanted people to notice me. I thought I was set for life. If I, even if I missed my goal and I didn't get drafted out of high school, I could get free college and I'd be set for life. I'd have a degree, then I'd make money. And if I didn't end up playing baseball, I was fine. And that, that made my life worse. It made my relationship with God worse because the more I got good at baseball, the more people were noticing me, the less I was noticing God. So as life got harder and as temptation was placed in front of me, I had no relationship with Jesus, no foundation, and no, no, nothing personal to, to keep me strong. So I began to mistreat people with my life. I used my popularity in school to put down others and to curse them. I made them feel like they were nothing. I, I was a terribly, terrible example to my younger siblings. I, I introduced them to sin. I introduced them to the things of this world, and I encouraged them to participate in it. I turned them away from God, and I, I sinned in front of them. And my siblings that looked up to me saw me sinning and screaming at my parents and hurting people. I openly hurt others. Um, I openly hurt my family. There were huge fights in my family. My family was broken, and I was a huge part of it. And I fell into deep sin. I was bound by sin that began to control me. And all because I started to worship myself and I didn't have a foundation in the word of God, I was bound to things that I never wanted to ever take part in in the first place. So I was messed up. I was broken. And this is just less than four years ago. I was absolutely broken. Completely running from the God in the Bible, in bondage to sin, Yet all of this time, I went to youth group and won all the Bible trivia games and fooled my youth pastor and made him think that I was the perfect kid. See, I knew all the answers at Bible trivia. I knew what the Bible said, but I never spent time in God's word and I never let it change my heart. I never let it save, sanctify, send, or sustain me. And it, it didn't change me. It didn't change who I was. I wasn't changed by God's word and I was completely broken. See, we said from the start, God's word saves, 
sanctifies, sends, and sustains. And the, the reality is, for most of high school, I try to do all four of those things on my own. We said from the start, God, God's Word does all of these things, but I, I thought I didn't need saved because I thought I was good enough on my own. I knew the Bible trivia. That was good enough for me to be saved. God knew how awesome I was, so I didn't need to be saved. So I thought I saved myself. Sanctified. For those of you who don't know, write this down. Sanctified means to be holy or to be set apart. So when I say God's word sanctifies you, that means it helps you to get rid of sin. It helps you to be more like God. It helps you to fall in love with him more. So I thought, since God loved me so much and God saw how awesome I was, I didn't need sanctified. I thought I was good enough on my own. Maybe, maybe I could be sanctified by being better at baseball because God would be more impressed with me and others would be more impressed with me. But the truth is, I wasn't being sanctified at all. I was actually becoming more broken. I tried to send myself. What I mean by that is I made the plan for my life. I decided that I wanted to play baseball. I decided that I wanted to, to do whatever I wanted. I decided where I was going. I had my five-year plan, my 10-year plan, and I wasn't listening to God's plan for my life. And because of that, there was nothing to sustain me. I was broken. There was no rest. I was scarred. I couldn't live this awful life that I had put myself through anymore. There was nothing to save, sanctify, send, and sustain me because the only thing that does those things is the Word of God. And I didn't have that. I tried to do all of these things on my own, but I couldn't do it. But then the coronavirus happened. <laughs> Uh, COVID, COVID happened, all of our lives shut down, we couldn't go anywhere, we couldn't do anything, and that was really awful for me because, as I said, I hated my family, and I was stuck at home with a family that I didn't want to be around. And there was brokenness in my family, there was fighting in my family, and I had participated in all of it. So I knew that these few months of quarantine were going to be the worst months of my life. But everything changed a week into quarantine when my friend Tyler intervened. Tyler was one of my Christian friends. We hung out at youth group, and I pretty much fooled everyone in my life. They all thought that I was the perfect Christian kid except for my family and Tyler. He knew how broken I was. And so a week into quarantine, he knew my family situation. He knew that I was going to be struggling, and he dropped a book off on my porch and, and challenged me to read it. It was a Christian book. It's called The Explicit Gospel by Matt Chandler. All of you students in here, I think you should write that down and maybe read it for yourself because it changed my life. I had no desire to read this book, but it was on my porch. It was a free book, and I thought, why not? My, I knew my parents would encourage me to read it, so reading this book was a good excuse for me to shut my bedroom door and have peace and quiet without my family for a few hours. So stuck with a family that I didn't want to see, forced to spend time with them, and with the book as my only escape, I went up in my room, shut the door, and read it. And flipping through the pages of the explicit gospel, flipping through the pages of that book, for the first time in my life, I realized the truth. See, I flipped through that book, and that, the book was really heavy on the fact that we without God are nothing. John 15 talks about how without God, we are nothing. Romans 3 says, with, apart from God, we are, are worthless. And the truth is, if you haven't heard that this week, that's, that's the gospel, guys. Without Jesus Christ, our lives are worthless. He is the only thing that gives us worth and beauty. And with, with Jesus Christ, our lives have incredible value. Our, our lives are glorious, and we are used for good and used for God's glory. But apart from God, we are worthless. So for me, as someone who is worshiping myself, for me who thought that baseball won my salvation, that I would, I would do what I wanted. I wanted to play pro. I wanted to do what I wanted. I wanted to make myself look good. Reading through that book and realizing, apart from God, I am worthless, it broke me. For the first time reading that book, I understood that I was a broken, sinful man and that God sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross to pay the punishment for my sin once and for all. And he died for me, not because anything I had done, 
but so that I can be saved by grace alone, apart from works, so that I have no, nothing to boast about. And when I realized this, I realized God's incredible love for me, which we've been talking about all week. Isaiah 43, 1 through 4 talks about how God has chosen us. He says, I've called you by name. You are mine. When you walk through the waters, I'll be with you. The waves, they will not overwhelm you because I am your God. I give whole countries, whole nations in exchange for you because I love you. I love you individually. And I realized those verses and I realized those truths. And for the first time in my life, I fell in love with God. And I didn't fall in love with this Bible trivia thing, this, this wanting to be smarter than other people thing. I fell in love with the God that created me and formed me with his hands and his very breath. So after reading the explicit gospel, for the first time in my life, I closed that book, picked up my Bible, and began to read it. And for the next few months, I never stopped. We were in quarantine. There was nothing to do. So I would sit in my room and read my Bible for hours every day. Some nights I read my Bible for, I'm not, I'm, I, mean, I am recommending this, but I'm not saying you have to, but I read my Bible for like eight to 10 hours a day at times. I would, I would read my Bible till three or four in the morning because not because I'm trying to brag about that, not because I'm saying that you have to read your Bible for eight hours a day, but because I was so captivated by God's truth that God loved me and God cared for me. And I wanted to fill myself with that all the time. I had nothing else to do, so might as well do that. Um, I became excited for church service each Sunday, and I couldn't wait for Wednesdays to tell my life group about what God was doing in my life. My relationships with my family began to mend. And now the, the family that I showed you, that this picture of me with my family, these are my best friends. My, my addictions and my sin struggles faded away. And they don't have a grip on me anymore. I was no longer worried about gl glorifying myself. God removed my desire for myself and replaced them with his. I'd fallen in love with him, and I wanted to bring him glory. So soon after I started to read God's word, I saw God's word save me. On July 15th, 2020, the word of God saved me for good. Through a conversation with my youth pastor, I recognized my need for a savior, my need to, for Jesus Christ. So that summer, after four months of reading the Bible every day, I asked God to have control of my life. I gave my life to him, and I experienced salvation from my sin and my shame. Praise God, right? <laughs> Praise God that he has provided freedom for all of you. All of you have the opportunity, if you're not already, to be saved by the word of God, by saved by, by Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. So for the first time in my life, I humbled myself and I allowed the word of God to save me. Soon after, the word of God sanctified me. It made me more holy. It made me more like God. See, I became free from sin in my life. And my, like I said, my relationship with my family was mended. I learned how to treat people better for like the first time in my life. I was nice to someone. And this took time. I don't want you to think that the word of God just sanctifies you immediately. It does sanctify you immediately, but it takes time. We all sin for our whole lives. So for me, it, it took time. It, it took a few years for me to, to put off the, the deep sin that was rooted in my life. But from the moment that I was saved, the word of God started to free me from sin in my life. It didn't have a grip on me anymore. I recognized how much I had sinned and how much I had wronged God, and I had no reason to seek my own glory or anymore because God had done everything for me. So I learned to be like him. I learned to put off my sin and live peaceably with those around me. And as I continued to be sanctified, the word of God sent me. In the fall of my senior year, I actually think the sending is one of the craziest parts of my story. Um, in the fall of my senior year, I decided to attend Cedarville University where uh, and study biblical language. So for me, this was completely life-changing. Previously, I decided that I wanted to play pro baseball, that I wanted to, to glorify myself with my career. But my senior year of high school, I quit baseball, and I pursued a career in full-time ministry. 
because I decided that baseball was my idol and baseball was my God. And I'm not saying baseball is bad. If anyone in here plays sports, keep that up. Uh, play sports. They're good for you. But for me, baseball took the place of God. And I couldn't have baseball and God, so I got rid of baseball. So I gave it up, and I went to Cedarville University to pursue a degree so that someday I can make a difference for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I decided that uh, I would use my degree to translate the Bible in tribal communities across the world. See, many people don't know this, but there's actually 3,000 languages in the world that still don't have the Bible in their language. And so because God's word changed me, I want to go to the nations and I want to translate the Bible into new languages so that people can experience in other countries what we've experienced this week. And I pray that God will use my life to do incredible things for his glory and not my own. And I pray that God would do abundantly more than I could ask or think with my life. But the truth is, I wouldn't be doing the sending. I wouldn't be going to the nations if God's word didn't save or sanctify me. It's all because of God's word that any of us can do anything. And through all of this ministry, through this week, through this summer, and, and through my degree at Cedarville, God's word is what sustains me. It's my motivation to press on. It's my hope, my wisdom, my guidance, my encouragement. And it reminds me every day of what God has done for me. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30 says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, give me your burden. Give me everything that weighs you down. Give me your tires and your burdens. And I, Jesus Christ, your only Savior, your only God, will give you rest. I will sustain you. I will comfort you. I will take care of you. And so every single day, through the hard times, through the struggles, through not sleeping this week, God's word is what fuels me and sustains me no matter what. The truth is, the truth is, God's word saved me, it sanctified me, it sent me, and it sustained me. And it's really cool what God has done for me. I, I praise God I, every day for what he's done for me, but I don't think we should just leave it at that. I think God's word can do incredible things for each and every one of you. In fact, I know God's word can do each and every one of those things. It can save, send, save, sanctify, send, and sustain you because it promises that it will. So I don't, I don't want you to step away from this power track and think, wow, Trey's really cool. Trey has a good story. Did you hear he was good at baseball? I want you to step away from this power track and understand God's word has transforming power. God's word can transform every single one of you. It promises that it will. It is a promise. God's word can save you. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk. That's the word of God, that by it you may grow up into salvation. Long for scripture, long for the Bible, that you may be saved. Ephesians 6, 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God is the Holy Spirit that fills you and allows you to do incredible things for the Word of God or for, for God's glory. But it's also your salvation. It is the Bible that saves you. There's a few other verses down there you can write down if you'd like. Make sure you write down all of these verses. They are awesome. God's Word has the power to sanctify you. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The word of God has the power to make you complete, equipped for every good work. You might be saying right now, I'm sinful, Trey. I'm broken. You don't know what I've done. But the Bible has the power to make you complete. The, the man of God, or the Bible has the power to make you a man or woman of God that is able to do big things for the glory of God. John 17, 17, Jesus prays, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. The truth of God's word has the power to sanctify you and make you holy. 
It has the power to fuel a lifetime of ministry, whether you're doing it as a professional or you're doing it in the workforce outside of the church. God's word has the power to send you. One of my life verses is Psalm 119, 105, which says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The truth is, God's word is a light to your path. God's word tells you where you're going to be in in five years, ten years. It tells me what I want to do with my future. But at the same time, when I don't see the future, when I don't see what, what, the, what God has for me in the next five, 10 years, God's word is a light right over my feet that I can just take one next step at a time. When I don't see the future, God's word is a light to my path that tells me, you know what, Trey? You don't know what next week brings. You don't know what tomorrow brings. But today, just take the right step and I will provide for you. So God's word sends you. It is the light that, that takes you where you should go. God's word sustains you. Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Proverbs 30, verse 5, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Listen, God's word will never let you go. Your family, your friends, maybe even the church, they will let you down. They will hurt you. This life is hard. And there will be times where you're upset at people. You might be upset at your pastor. But listen, God's word doesn't let you down because it's spoken by the perfect, holy, loving God who never changes and never lets you down. When all else fails, God's word remains. He will uphold you. He won't let you go. So God's word has transforming power. Write that down. God's word has transforming power. It has the power to save, sanctify, send, and sustain. It has the power to overtake your entire life. It saves, sanctifies, sends, sustains. You should read the Bible every single day because it overtakes your life and changes you. It makes you who you were meant to be. The Word of God has transforming power. So I want to remind you the challenge from the beginning. Pay attention. Write down what's on the slides, and for 30 to 60 days, apply the truth that I've presented to you. For 30 to 60 days, do these things. And so you might be asking, how do I do these things? What are the these things? How do I apply this message to my life? And I'm glad you're thinking that because I've got a couple points. First, how to read the Bible. Just write these psalm references down. They are a big deal. Pray these psalms. Or pray that God would help you to understand it. Real quick, I just want to read through these. They're beautiful prayers. Psalm 143, verse 8. Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love, for in you I trust. Make me to know the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. Psalm 119, 18. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. That's literally about reading the Bible. Open my eyes that I may understand your, your word. Psalm 86, 11, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Psalm 119, 36 and 37, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. And Psalm 90, verse 14, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. Pray these verses. Or just pray, God, help me to understand what your Bible says. Help me to understand your truth. Also, join church. Pay attention and get involved. Listen, when your pastor preaches every Sunday, he's teaching you how to read the Bible. So many times in high school, before I knew the Word of God, before I was reading God's Word, I sat in church and was like, this is stupid, this is boring. And I didn't pay attention. But when your pastor speaks, when your youth pastor teaches at youth group, even when, you're, when your worship pastor says something in the middle of the service, they are teaching you how to read the Bible. So when you pay attention and you get involved in church, you will learn naturally how to read the Bible. Next, read the Bible with someone older. Listen to me when I say this. I believe that you, as a, however old you are, you can understand what the Bible says. 
A very wise man once told me that the word of God is shallow enough that a child can get in and play like a pool, but it's deep enough like the ocean that the wisest man will never reach the bottom. So for you as a 14, 15, 16 year old, the Bible is, you are able to understand it. You are able to know what it, what it means. But at the same time, we are designed to live in community with one another. And the Bible commands older men and women to teach the younger men and women about God's word. So spend time reading the Bible with someone older. Ask a youth leader, hey, do you want to get coffee every Tuesday and you just teach me God's word? Because they will show you how to read the Bible and how to understand it. Next, read the Bible in context. Don't just read one verse and call it good for the day. Don't just, the verse of the day on the Bible app, that's a good thing. But if that's all you're doing for a day, that's not good. Read a passage. One of my professors at Cedarville challenged us, read a whole book of a Bible in a day. So you can get the, you can get the whole context and then go back and read a chapter at a time or a passage at a time. Because when you understand one passage or one verse in the context of the whole story, it helps you to understand it more. Re understand that each verse, there's verses before it and after it that help, help you to understand what the specific verse means or what a specific passage means. So read the Bible in context. Next, ask questions. There's a, a young man in our youth group that texts me all the time and asks me, what does this mean? And I love it. There's, there's nothing more awesome than when I wake up in the morning and I have a text of like three or four questions about the Bible. Because as an older person, I'm not that old, but as an older person, when someone younger asks me questions, I have an opportunity to teach them. And as a younger person, if you don't understand, ask questions. Because there are wise people that want to teach you. There are wise people that will explain things. And like I said, there, the scripture is deep enough that, that some people will never reach the bottom. So there are truly hard things to understand in Scripture. So, so you will have questions when you read. There are things in Scripture that even today I don't fully understand because God is incomprehensible. There's no way we can ever fully understand him. So ask questions because it is hard. And lastly, and most importantly, if you wrote nothing else down, please write this next thing down. The most important part of reading your Bible, don't give up. You might go home and read your Bible the next two weeks after Momentum, and you might not understand any of it. You might go home, and, and you might be, be curious about Scripture, but, but then you just hit a wall because it's boring or because you, you don't get it. But don't give up because someday you're going to be grateful that you spent time in God's Word. Someday you're going to be grateful that you understand Scripture more. It's hard at the beginning to understand. That's why you ask questions. That's why you read with someone older. That's why you pay attention in church because it's hard. But as you continue to practice, you will get better and better and you will be able to understand it more and more. So please pray these Psalms or pray that God would help you understand. Join the church, pay attention and get involved so that the pastors can teach you through their sermons how to read the Bible. Read it with someone older. Read it in context. Ask questions. And most importantly, do not give up. Don't give up. So I challenge you. <coughs> write these things down. And for the next 30 to 60 days, apply them to your life. And pray that God's word would change you. God's word would make you more like him. And that God would help you to understand it. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> I, uh, I want to do a, a short Q&A time. Um, we have eight minutes left. Um, but I do ask, don't ask me theological questions about God's word. Your youth pastor, your youth leader, they have time to help you understand things. But if you have questions about my story or my daily Bible reading, or my involvement in the church, I would love to talk about that. So, yes? Is there a specific book that you recommend to start with? And is there a book by your own, like, to go along with this? Yeah. Um, personally, 
Uh, I, I recommend two books. Um, I, I would say, in reality, uh, the best way to start is at the beginning. So, like I said, read the Bible in context. So, if you don't, um, if you, if, if you, you're not going to understand the New Testament if you don't understand what happened in Genesis. So, I would say start at Genesis and, and work through. I also say start in the Gospel of John uh, just because I love Jesus and I love the way John depicts his story. Um, and it's super life giving. Um, so, Genesis or John. Um, what I do in my personal reading time is I go through the Bible in a year plan on the Bible app. You can go through it at your own pace. You don't have to go through it in a year if that's too much for you. But I love it because there's usually a devotional with the scripture if you don't understand. And I think the most important part to understanding the Bible is just reading the whole thing. Um, you're not going to understand the. You're not going to understand what Leviticus means if you just go home and read it right now. But the more you read the whole Bible and understand its point in the whole the whole grand scheme of Scripture, it makes sense. Um, does that answer your question? What's up, Colton? Hey, I have a question about number five. That question. I really believe in the power of the question. I believe that we listen in a great way, especially when we're trying to stay fresh. In the Word of God, ask fresh questions, get fresh answers. So, what uh, could you give us an example of two or three questions that you read Scripture and you ask um, in order to get healthy, fresh, biblical answers? Yeah. Uh, for these students, or these students, as myself, as I go home and be fired up about the Word of God. Yeah. Um, I think like one question that's the first question for me is, um, what does this teach me about Jesus? What does this teach me about God? Um, I forget who I said it, who said it this week, but one of the night speakers said that we think the Bible is about us, but it's not. It's about God. Um, so, uh, what does it teach me about God? Because the truth is, it's not it's not the practical application in the Bible that necessarily changes your heart. It's realizing how glorious God is that changes your heart. Um, and then once you, once you ask yourself, what does it teach you about God? In light of that answer, what does it teach you about yourself? Um, what, what do you do? Um, it's not all about you, but there is practical application, and it is good to understand what you do in light of Scripture. Uh, that's what I would say. Any other questions? I'll, I'll answer questions all day if you guys have them. All right, we'll call it. Oh, what, what, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, is there, do you think that there's a right or wrong way to do this? Because like, I've heard from a lot of adults in the last like, do you get cover to cover, don't you get cover to cover? But there's no way. Yeah. Um, for where you guys are at in your life, I, I believe there is a wrong way to read the Bible. But as a young person, just read it. Um, read it and ask your youth leaders if you don't understand what it means. Um, I, do, I will say the wrong way to read the Bible is to read just verses out of context. Like if you're going to read the Bible, start at the beginning of a book and read the whole book. Um, but other than that, just read it. Um, it's really important just, just to be in God's word and, and to spend time in it. Does that make sense? Who else has questions? All right, guys, uh, you can come up to me if you have more questions, but thanks for coming, and I hope you guys have an awesome day.